grace and peace be unto you. Uh, you've been missed greatly. Uh, I'm glad uh, to be in your midst once again and of course in the Lord's presence as well. Uh, and uh, I, I've missed uh, not uh, preaching in Revelation, so this is a good point in this new year to begin anew in Revelation. And we progress to verse number five. And our scripture reading this morning is, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for um, these words this testimony, this great book that we're in the midst of trying to grasp and understand our greater relationship with you through Christ. Help us to understand who Jesus is truly. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, you are, we just sang, you are the maker, the creator of our heart. And because of Jesus, uh, we're here. And because of the great I am, I am. And I'll be eternally grateful for that. This lesson is entitled The Patmos Verdict. Thus far, we've seen the Patmos vision. It is the revelation, not a revelation. And the Patmos vow. It is written to churches, not to religion. It is written to his servants, not to the non Committal. We're working these V's with several sermons in between. Now we consider the Patmos verdict. Thus far we've laid the groundwork for the one who is, the one who was, and the one who will forever be. We are blessed to view the glorified Christ set before us by the Spirit of God for the remainder of this chapter and the rest of this book for that matter, and it is a triumphant Jesus that we see. Remember, John did not send this prophecy to Christ's assemblies to satisfy their mere, mere curiosity about end time events, or us for that matter. He did so to show us the absolute victory that our Lord will have over all the cohorts of hell and evil. Amen. So this overview will be our focus throughout our glorious journey with Jesus this year. Like an epic drama, like no other, the book of Revelation takes us on an adventure all the way to glory with our King. Praise the Lord. It is replete with characters, conflicts, climaxes, and it draws us to a wondrous, incredible conclusion. And because of that conclusion, I don't have to fear what tomorrow brings. COVID-19 does not terrify me. It's just another virus. I don't have to be afraid of what this year may bring because I know what will happen along this journey that I take with Jesus. It'll be filled with blessings. I have read this book several times. I know the end. We win because Jesus wins. The intensity of this book continues to build 
to a stunning conquest as God reveals to us his finished glorious plan in his son. We sang a song, a hymn from the Psalms that raises the question, who am I? And of course the psalm writer was asking that of himself, that God would care about him. But this also has messianic implications, and that means there is a greater uh, shepherd than that of David that is posing this question in the Psalms, who am I? It's Jesus coming in the flesh, praising God that he, his father, would care about him. Wow. As we move deeper into its pages and delve deeper into its truth, we periodically must return to the big picture. The big picture is our glorious king, our triumphant king, our victorious king, our king ruling, our king reigning, and our king conquering. What a stunning message. What a beautiful message to begin this new year with Jesus Christ, with our focus centered in this triumphant, glorious king. It's now time to see this king in greater detail. And like the Greeks of old, who would not be satisfied until they saw Christ, said to the disciples, Sir, we would see Jesus. And as they did, so will we. We see him here, and in the verses following, we will see no less than 17 different distinct descriptions of Christ in this one chapter alone. And I'm not going to number them for you. You read this chapter. You, for yourself, number these descriptions of your king that you see. I love it. And this morning we begin in verse number five, seeing our Lord like never before. And from Jesus Christ, revelation is of Christ. Revelation is about Christ. Revelation is from Christ. So once more we are reminded this message is from our Lord to his churches. And now we see him giving his own eyewitness account as John describes that he alone stands before the courtroom of heaven to document the evidence and the facts that he gives. And it's right before us. It's right in front of us. It's about Jesus, who is the faithful witness. John tells us he is trustworthy in the evidence that he gives. So right here in the very beginning of Revelation and its introduction of this great prophetical treatise, we have the first of these many descriptions of glory and majesty befitting the person and character of our Savior. The term witness comes from the Greek word martis, and it is used in three distinct areas. First, it's used in the scriptures in a historical sense. It speaks of a researcher who records his findings and meticulously documents his results. It is the testimony to the facts of the matter. And it's Jesus' testimony. Secondly, it's used in a legal sense where a witness is called upon to give evidence in a great court of law. He is under oath to give his testimony as to the truth. 
And so is Jesus right here. He is the faithful witness. Lastly, it is used in a credible sense like none other can, as the term speaks of a committed individual who is willing to die, willing to be martyred for a cause beyond that of his own life. Is there not a cause? This word for witness used here is where we get our English expression martyr from. And this is the very compelling evidence that our Redeemer gives that would save you and I. And Jesus is that witness telling us of the reality of who he is. The evidence he gives is true. The evidence he documents is factual. The evidence he offers, he was willing to die for. Marvelous. We know babies are born to live, but this Jesus was born to die because the scriptures tell us that at his birth, he was wrapped with the shrouds of death. Luke defines it as swaddling clothes. And swaddling clothes were bolts of linen hidden in small caves and caverns for those who died in arid desert regions around Israel. And he died on a martyr's cross so that we might experience a life that is abundant as it is eternal. Praise God. He is that faithful witness. The Greek term for faithful comes from a word, or from the word pistos. It depicts belief and describes one whom you can place your trust in. It is an expression that also pictures to us one who is pointing the way. He is the author and the finisher of the faith, the Hebrew author declares. He is pointing the way for us for the rest of our lives. His witness then is to be heard. His witness is to be believed. His witness is to be received. His witness points us to that which is real. His witness leads us to the truth. His witness then is a pathway to follow to its necessary conclusion. So what was Jesus a faithful witness of? What is the evidence he presents? What is the testimony uh, that he gives? Just listen to John. Because John is writing down this message. And it's the message from a faithful witness, Jesus. So let's go to the gospel that bears John's name. And just listen to the evidence that Jesus gives. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. This is the evidence. This is his witness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, John 3, 17. This is his witness. This is the evidence that Jesus gives to this world and to you and I. Jesus testifies, verily, verily, truth, truth, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that has sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. How great is this faithful witness, this witness that Jesus gives to the world. Jesus testifies, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out for no reason. John 6, 37. 
Have you come to this Jesus? Have you believed in his testimony? Jesus testifies and says this, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, that's the great I am, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. And Jesus, this same Jesus testifies, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any take them out of my hand. Do you believe the evidence? Do you believe the testimony? Have you accepted this Jesus as your Savior and Lord? This then is the evidence given to us. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were to die, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And Martha said, Yea, Lord, I believe. This is his testimony. This book is his evidence. Wow. The evidence Jesus offers is this. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. John 8, 30. The evidence Jesus shares, and this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. 1 John 2, 25. These are just some of the courtroom documents that John leaves with us concerning the faithful witness that Christ provides. His promises are reality. Have you believed the witness that Christ provides? Have you trusted in the evidence given? If not, why not? If not, why not now? If not, there is no better time then right here in this new year, right here in the middle of your now, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Now is the time to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Now is the time to ask Jesus into your heart. Now is the time to ask Jesus for the gift of eternal life that he graciously is offering the entire book called the Bible is his account of the truth. It is the evidence he gives. It is his record. It is his reality. It is his life. It is his witness of himself to you and I. It is the witness he was born for. It was the witness he died for. It was the witness he arose for. It is the witness of blessed hope we have in him. Our King is coming. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Titus 2.13 Praise God. This is our hope. And our hope is made reality in the faithful witness of Jesus Christ. How great is that? Let's return our thoughts once more to his faithful witness. As we see the second description of our glorious Lord given here, because now he is entitled the first begotten of the dead. Ooh, amen. What does that reveal to us? Messianically, in the Psalms, I want you to understand Jesus prays this. Just listen to him. And in this verse is, is my expanded translation from Hebrew study. Quicken me. That word quicken. We sang about it this morning. He gives us breath and living water we sang. This word quicken means to breathe life into. It means to give breath again. 
Quicken me. Jesus prays that I might keep the testimony, the witness, that I may give the evidence to the fact that I might fulfill the reality of my mouth. Psalms 119, verse number 88, and that's my expanded translation of that passage. Jesus' prayer to his Father, give me breath again. And he rose. My God, how beautiful. This then is one of our Lord's resurrection prayers. I love it. God bless your heart, he arose from the grave to keep his word. Wow. Mm. Jesus' testimony to us is Jesus' word. Jesus' witness is Jesus' book. Jesus' evidence is Jesus' resurrection. And Jesus' proof is seen in Jesus coming again. And that's our blessed hope. God bless your heart. Jesus said, to this end was I born. Born to die. And not for this cause I came into the world that I should bear record of the truth. This is the cause that I may bear record of the truth, that I may give this testimony and evidence of reality. And then Jesus goes on to say, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. John 18, 37. Jesus said, though I bear record, give evidence of myself, yet my record, the evidence I give is true. John 8, 14. Turn with me now to Luke 24, and let's just continue to read about the evidence that Jesus gives to us. Luke 24, verse number 46. And he said, and Jesus said unto them, thus it is written, and thus behooved, it was necessary, it was right for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And now this gospel is being spread in Pakistan. 80 million people with less than a quarter of 1% are saved. Pray for Pakistan. And ye are witnesses of these things. And now, God bless your heart, we are witnesses of this reality. Again, once more, our attention is drawn back to the words that Jesus is the first begotten from the dead. Literally, he is the first one born out from among the dead. Take note here, this term, firstborn one, does not mean that in the Bible that there were not other incidents of people being raised up even to heaven because they were. 
Because in the Old Testament, both Elijah and Enoch were raised up into heaven. Also, when the body of a dead man was placed next to Elisha, that man too was raised from the dead. 2 Kings 13, verses 20 and 21. And Jesus raised up the dead prior to his crucifixion and resurrection on no less than three occasions. And at the Lord's death, Matthew records many graves were opened with the dead saints coming forth alive. Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53. So how can Jesus be the first one born from out of the dead when we see others in time being raised up before Jesus died? How then can Christ be called the first begotten from the dead? And here's where it gets really interesting. The phrase firstborn one comes from the Greek term prototokos, meaning first in rank and honor, first in importance and value, and first both in time and eternity. We don't have any trouble understanding that Jesus should be first in rank or first in value as we treasure him in our lives. Since there is not one truth more essential to our salvation than the fact that Jesus arose from the dead. And this is what verse number five is all about. But our initial difficulty comes in trying to grasp this Greek expression in terms of time and eternity. Because we see other examples in the scriptures of people being raised from the dead before Jesus was. Therefore, it is very important that we see our Lord's resurrection not from the viewpoint of of our concept of time, but from God's perspective in eternity. From our Heavenly Father's eternal view, His Son, as the Lamb of God, stood sacrificed from the very foundation of creation. He was the first one born out of the dead in His Father's eyes. <laughs> from our Heavenly Father's eternal view Jesus was the first one born out of the grave That stone that was rolled away was but a pebble to the rock of ages. He came forth. He is the first one born out of death and because he is, so will we. Huh. I want you to pay very close attention to the last phrase that you will find in Revelation 13, 8. So I know some of you are skimming over there now. We're not getting into the depth of this verse, but I want you to notice the last phrase because it reads that Christ stood slain from the foundation of the earth before Adam was ever created and Abel ever died in God's mind Jesus had already died to give us life in the Father's omniscience 
Our Lord already stood hung on a cross. In our Father's perfect mind, Christ had died beforehand for the sins of mankind. Ephesians 1.4, just listen. According as he hath chosen us in him. Chosen means the Father chose, selected, numbered us in Christ. That means God already had a determined plan to save all those who would receive his son. And that all is very, very important. It's all inclusive. And 110 times in the New Testament, the word whosoever is used. That includes you and I. It includes all who will hear this faithful witness, Jesus, and accept him. Accept the reality that he died for us that we might live in him. He had already set his eternal purpose into motion. before the canopies of the stars he rolled out. <laughs> Note the time element found in Ephesians 1.4 because all of this was done before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In Titus 1-2 we read, In the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I want you to pay special attention before the foundation. Before the world began. All of these verses attest to the reality that Jesus Christ is the first one born out of death. He died for us that we might live eternally in Him. Second Timothy 1 9 reads, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace. And I want you to get this before the world began Jesus stood slain before the world began this was God's purpose this was God's plan from the very beginning before the stars were spoken into existence God blessed your heart before God breathed life into mankind Jesus was already the first one born out of death. Still with me? 1 Peter 1.20 tells us that we were redeemed with the precious blood of the Lamb who verily was foreordained. God already had a plan into motion. This same Jesus before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. Do you get what God is saying? Before the world began, before the foundation of creation was ever laid out, Jesus stood slain. And not only slain, Resurrected. Praise God. Still with me. Romans 16, 25. Now to him, God that has the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret 
since the world began. Hebrews 4.3, where the Hebrew writer tells us of the gospel that was preached unto us. In verse number 3, For we who have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished. The works were finished. Please get this phrase. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. Whoa! <laughs> from these passages and many more, we can understand this, that in God's mind, he had an everlasting plan already in action that his son would come to die and rise again and come again. Amen. So our future has already been set in the stone of eternity before he ever spoke light into existence. In fact, God already sees us in his eternity. Such a reality is far too wondrous for me to even begin to fathom. So my God can certainly stretch our minds with his, and he does so in his word. He widens our comprehension with his eternity. He broadens the borders of our thought with his. He expands our forever with him. He stretches our finite abilities to grasp his greatness. And he does so in his infinity. How great is that? I can't even begin to grasp such glory. Therefore, in God's boundless, unrestrained, limitless, everlasting mind, my eternity is held safe and secure in his hands. Therefore, my Jesus can be and truly is the first begotten from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for such unsurpassed greatness as this. This purpose that is God's, then being forever and ever, is already a done deal in his sovereign mind and tender heart. Now some of the misguided might brand me a Calvinist here wrongly because I hate Calvinism in all of its facets. There are one-point Calvinists, there are two- and three-point Calvinists, there are five-point Calvinists. I'm a no-point Calvinist. But that does not prevent me in believing in the greatness of my God's sovereignty and his absolute right to give man free will and offer his loving grace to everyone, whosoever will, may come. Wow. In closing, then this son is first in every sense of the word from the Father's eternal, perfect perspective. I love it. Jesus is first. He is first in rank and honor. He is first in importance and value. He is first in all of time and eternity. Therefore, he alone is worthy. He merits my worship. 
He has secured my praise. He warns my service. He has won my heart. He has earned my love. And sweet people, he alone deserves to be first in our lives, in our living, in this new year. Jesus Christ. Faithful witness. First begotten from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. God bless. Till next week. Love you.